Superconducting quantum circuits. Understanding a superconducting qubit is very similar to understanding an amplitude modulation AM radio. In the video down here, you can see my homemade AM radio. What are the key elements of an AM radio? First of all, a resonator, which in the AM radio jargon is called a tank circuit. This is typically followed by a demodulator or detector, effectively and resonators are what we basically use to implement superconducting qubits, as we shall see in the rest of this lecture and colloquium. Whereas detectors are the systems we use to measure, to read out these devices. Detectors in AM radios are based on diodes, like the one you can see in the picture down here. I will discuss a little bit more about detectors in the screencast which will follow this video. How can we make a resonator? One way to make a resonator is by connecting in parallel an inductor L with a capacitor C. The constitutive relations of an inductor and a capacitor allow us to write the flux phi on the inductor as the inductance L times the current I dotless. The dot will be used for time derivatives. The current I is the current flowing on the inductor L. Similarly for the capacitor. We can now simply derive with respect to time both these constitutive relations to find. In this manner, we find that the derivative with respect to time of the flux, which by Faraday Norman's law it is nothing but the voltage drop over the inductor, is equal to Li. And similarly for the capacitor, Q dot, which is the current on the capacitor, is equal to Cd. Let's add the two subscripts. We can now use these constitutive relations to write down the instantaneous power at the time tau, P at tau of this circuit. This power can be rewritten by using the concept of total derivative as Now that we have the knowledge of the instantaneous power of this circuit, we can write the energy simply as the integral from a zero time to a generic time t in d tau of this power, which is d over d tau, therefore obtaining this is the energy of NLC resonator. In a previous video, we already encountered LC objects like the one sketched up here. In that case, we studied the admittances and impedances of this object, and from the knowledge of the admittance, we were able to obtain the resonance angular frequency, omega naught equal 2 pi f naught of this circuit, which I remind you is 1 over the square root of Lc. For a single circuit like this, or a generic circuit, we call it naught like f naught. If we have a couple of systems, we can specify the subscript accordingly, as we do in the rest of this colloquium. In addition, in a previous video, we also studied the case when we add dissipation to this problem in the form of a resistor capital R, in this case, how good the circuit is, the LC resonator, is represented by a quantity which we call the internal quality factor QI. See a previous video on this topic. As it turns out, linear harmonic oscillators or resonators like the LC resonator studied here are not sufficient to implement a superconducting qubit. In fact, in order to implement a superconducting qubit, we need a nonlinearity. In a previous lecture, in a previous video, we already encountered nonlinearity, which is a Josephson junction, the circuit element represented by this symbol, a cross, JJ for Josephson junction. See our previous lecture and video on this topic. In this case, we found that the current, that is the constitutive relation for the Josephson junction, is given by a critical current IC naught times the sine of a constant kj times the flux jj across the junction. Now, I want you to use our digital forum to discuss among yourselves 
how to use a similar procedure calculating first the power and then the energy by integration, which we use for the LC circuit, how to calculate first the power of a Josephson junction at the generic time tau, so the instantaneous power, and then eventually the energy Ej or Josephson energy associated with a Josephson junction. This is the uh, problem, the home assignment I will actually do on our digital platform. Suppose now to couple by means of a Kepler capacitor an LC resonator here on the left with this structure comprised of the parallel connection of a capacitor and the Josephson junction. This structure here is what we call a transmon qubit. It may seem rather complicated to study mathematically the coupling between these two circuit elements. However, classically, the energy representing the coupling between these two objects is given by the electric field associated with the resonator dotted with P, which is the electric dipole moment of the transmon. So it's nothing but P dot E, the energy of a dipole in an external field. Now, here we're going to study the electric field on the left and the dipole moment on the right. First classically, then quantum mechanically. So let us begin with E. Classically, E is given by some amplitude A times the cosine, let's say, of omega T, and it could be omega R, which is the resonance frequency of the resonator, plus, let's say, a phase phi on the resonator. By means of uh, Euler relation, we can rewrite this quantity as in this fashion. If we now we wanted to represent this quantity quantum mechanically in the Heisenberg picture, we simply add here, we promote it to a quantum mechanical operator by adding a dagger in a which are rising and lowering operator for harmonic oscillator. And we have seen harmonic oscillator in simple quantum mechanics. All right. What about uh, the dipole moment P here for the transmon? We can for now think about the transmon as if it were an atom characterized when diagonalized with a set of energy eigenstates M. By means of uh, Dirac's theorem two times, we can rewrite, we can promote this P to a quantum mechanical operator, therefore writing it as in this fashion. We can now perform an approximation and consider only the two lowest energy eigenstates G and E, the ground and first excited state respectively of the transmon, and therefore we can rewrite this P as Now, this prefactor is a simple coefficient, whereas GE plus its emission conjugate is nothing but sigma x. We can now put together these two quantities in this quantum mechanical fashion and rewrite this energy, which here we wrote classically, but quantum mechanically, in the Schrodinger picture, so we go back in the Schrodinger picture here, and therefore in that case we obtain the quantum Hamiltonian of this object, of the interaction in particular of these uh, two objects, the resonator and the transmon qubit here, and so this will, give, will be given by the product of a few prefactors, this A, this GPE, which we simply call H bar G, the coupling strength, which is also proportional to CRQ, as a matter of fact, this is built in inside these coefficients, the CRQ. This, then we have, this is a billion, so we can flip it over. And so we have sigma x, which is associated with the transmon, with that product becomes a tensor product with a dagger plus a. Now here we can have two possible outcomes. In one case, we can use this resonator as a classical field, and so we go back to a cosine of omega t plus a phase, if you want. And so in this case, we obtain Hamiltonian, which is proportional to sigma x times the cosine 
of omega t. This is what we use to control a qubit that is to make gates, T1 measurements, uh, and all possible Hadamard X and Y gates, as we will see in the screencast following this video. The other possibility is when we set the two objects to have a difference in frequencies, omega q minus omega r, much larger than the coupling coefficient g. In this case, we can perform a Taylor series, which allows us to write down this interaction Hamiltonian effectively as something like h bar g squared over delta, where this quantity is delta, the tuning between the resonator and the transmon. This is nothing but second order perturbation theory, g squared over delta, you should have seen this in quantum mechanics, times sigma z, sigma x now becomes sigma z here, times a dagger a. And so if we remember to add also the fact that we have a resonator here, so we add the energy of the resonator, we note that the qubit, the transmon, effectively shifts the frequency of the resonator in one direction or another, because sigma z can have two eigenvalues, minus one or plus one. So depending whether I'm in the ground state or excited state of the transmon, the frequency of the resonator gets shifted. And that's the signature we use in our detector, which is based on diodes, as in the M radio, to detect whether we are in the ground or excited state, as we shall see in the next screencast. That's it.